And I think that as we progress through the message this morning, you'll see where the Lord has tied it all in. Um, didn't know exactly what the worship songs would be this morning, the prelude and all. But God, and I think you're going to see how it all ties in. Uh, I'm asking you a question before we turn to the text. Where do you long to be? Jerry's pointing up. I'd say the majority of you have answered in your mind. Heaven. Heaven. Now, for those of you who are feeling a little bit guilty, because you were thinking about a place on earth, okay, where do you long to be on earth? Dinner table. Dinner table? I mean, am I feeling the vibes of the beach? Yeah. The lake? Maybe the mountains? Maybe the place you grew up? Where do you long to be? Now, I must ask you this question. Did any of you think about church? Do you want to be in church? Well, we're here. Do you want to be in church? <laughs> but when you're away from your ready, do you want to be in church? Absolutely. All right. What about the rest of you? you know, do we want to be in church? Now, it's interesting. I ask that question. The majority of you probably were thinking, I really want to be in heaven. But do you want to be in church? Because we're going to see here in God's Word where they are connected. Did you know that? They are connected. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 84. You're going to see this. I'll give you a bit of background as you're turning there about this psalm. Now, this is a psalm of the sons of Korah. Many theologians believe, and I kind of agree with them, we're not certain who authored this psalm, who the human author was, but we know, of course, the Holy Spirit is author of Scripture, but we're not sure who penned this psalm. But many theologians believe maybe, perhaps there's a good chance, King David did. And he gave the lyrics, he gave the words, rather, he gave the words to the sons of Korah, and they said it to music. Because they were the musicians of the temple. And then he, he penned these words when he was longing to be in the house of God because he was exiled because of his son Absalom's rebellion. And David was just so anxious and full of anticipation to be in the temple. To be worshiping God once again. And he kind of penned this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to describe how all Israelite pilgrims how all Jews felt when they were going from their hometown to the temple in Jerusalem for one of the holy feasts. The times of celebration that God prescribed throughout the year. And how they were longing to get there. But also, this psalm is symbolic too. It's symbolic of us longing to be in the heavenly courts. The temple made without hands. To be with our heavenly Father. So we see all this tied in in this psalm. So let's read it together. Let's stand as we read Psalm 84, starting at verse 1 this morning. The psalmist says, How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and to swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Bega, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. O God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, Blessed is the man who trusts in you. And, O oh God, as we come to your word, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you inspired. Maybe it was King David. Maybe it was one of the sons of Korah. We don't know. It doesn't matter. But you inspired this text to encourage us, to help us, Lord, to know the longing and the love to be in your house, 
of worship and to longing and to love to be with you forever in the true temple made without hands. Lord, help us to see how all of this comes together. And Lord, how we can be encouraged this morning. As we already have, Lord, encourage us through your word as we walk and as we continue on our race and our journey. Let us finish it. Look into Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. And we pray these things in His holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. In verses 1 through 4, and verses 5 through 7, and verses 11 through 12, you see some human emotion here. You see some human emotion that the psalmist has about being in the house of God, and about being with God. And the first human emotion that you see that he has is, point number one, the anticipation. He has anticipation to be with God. The anticipation to be with God in verses 1 through 4. In verse 2 he says, my soul longs. Yes, the inner part of me longs. Yes, even faints. I'm, I'm so weary by anticipation to be with you, to be in the courts of the Lord. And my heart and my flesh, my whole entire being, cry out for the living God. The living God. Did you know God is living? God is not dead. God is not a dumb idol made by human hands. Our God is a living God. God hears you when you pray. God sees you. God knows you. He knows all. He knows the very number of the hairs of your head. He knows when you sat down this morning. He knows when you will rise up. He knows the thought that will come into your mind and the words that will come out of your lips before you even think them. Our God is a living God. And the psalmist here is full of anticipation to be in His courts and full of anticipation to be with Him. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Oh, I long to be in His temple. I long to be with His people. I long to hear the sons of Korah sing. I long to hear the instruments being played. I long to worship and to praise God. And He envies even the sparrows and the birds who build their nests in the temple. Verse 3. And in our, our, our inner temple, he really envies and he lo loves the people who have the blessing to be with God and be in his house all the time. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. Blessed are the Levites and the priests who are always with you, Lord. I wish that I could be. And you see this anticipation to be in God's house. Because, no, a true subject of the king loves being in the king's house. You thought about that? A true subject of the king loves to be in the king's courts. The psalmist here didn't have to be whipped to go to church, did he? He didn't have to be manipulated to show up. He didn't have to be begged to come to church. He wanted to come into the house of God. He wanted to be here. He was full of anticipation. And brothers and sisters in Christ, I know that you can relate as you can, as I know, and I understand, and I'm human too, there's some Sunday mornings where maybe I don't feel like being in the house of God. You ever been there? You just don't have the anticipation to be there. And you think maybe sometimes, Lord, I just as soon stay in bed today. What's wrong when we feel that way? It's because we don't understand or know we need the living God. You know, we need the living God. We need God. You know that song, don't you? Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. I would say every minute, we need Him. You know what? We need to be in His house. Did you know that? We need to be in His house. We need to be with His people. We need to be together. There's a reason why the Bible says, do not forsake the assembly of yourselves. What's that word? Together. Don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together. For there's something very, very special about when the body of Christ assembles together. And it is so good we were able to assemble together. You know, we missed that a lot over the last, what, 15 months? I was talking to many of you this morning. Things are beginning to change. Things are beginning to open up, are they not? And things are beginning to change in our culture finally. Finally. And you know what? It's so good. It's such a blessing to be able to come into the house of God. 
And I hope that we maybe learn some things. Learn not to take it for granted over the year 2020. And in the new year, we know we don't take the worship of God and the assembly of God's people together for granted. We are filled with anticipation to be here. You know, Jason and, and, and the rest of the praise band should not be the only ones filled with anticipation to be in God's house, right? All of us should be. And when we all are filled with that anticipation and that longing to be with God and live in God, you know what? It electrifies the atmosphere and the Holy Spirit is free to work the way that He wants to. So we come in just like, oh, well, I guess we got to be in church Sunday. <laughs> Does that grieve the Holy Spirit? That grieves the Holy Spirit. And there's a deeper truth here. You know what? The psalmist, he wanted to be in the house of God so badly. Because something was going on within him that should be going on within each one of, within each one of us. Did you know that? Something deeper here. Something deeper is going on. If a person longs to be in the house of God, it is symbolic. It represents a deeper longing. And that is found in Romans chapter 8. Now, if you want to turn there, you can. If not, just please listen. Romans chapter 8, verses 23 and 25. And listen to what the Bible says in Romans 8, 23. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit... Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of the body. Did you hear that? We who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, we Christians, we who have the Holy Spirit dwell within us, we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. That's right. We're eagerly waiting, anticipating the time. We know we're adopted. We know we're in God's family. But you know what? We're waiting for the time when Christ will return and we will receive a body like it unto His and we will be free from this body of flesh. We will be free from this broken world and we will be free from the evil one and we'll be able to see God in all of His moments and all of His glory. Amen. That's the longing. That's the groaning that all of us should have. Do you see that in Psalm 84? Do you see that with songs? So that desire, my soul longs, yes, even faints for the course of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. That is representative of a deeper desire to be with God. A deeper desire. And we should feel that when we come into His house and be with His people. Because that's representative of our true longing to receive our redeemed, glorified bodies like another Christ. To be done with this world and to be victorious in Christ and to say to the Lord, I have finished my race. I fought the good fight. I am through and I'm going to be with you. That anticipation is there. And also, you see the motivation point to the motivation to get to God. You see the anticipation, but the motivation, there's a little bit of difference there because motivation means a reason or desire that spurs to action. If you have motivation, if you're motivated, it is a reason or desire that spurs you to action. It's action-oriented. And you know, and I know, that many times the journey gets long. And the journey gets dry. And the journey gets wearisome. Does it not? The faithful, as we walk, as we progress along the journey of faith, as we run our race, it gets tiresome. And we need motivation. And you see that starting in verse 5. Blessed is a man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring, and the rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength, and each one appears before God in Zion. You say, what in the world does all that mean? What does the psalmist talk about? Did you know there was a real valley of Baca on the way to Jerusalem? It was quite a ways from Jerusalem. And you know what? It was a dry, arid place. It was a dry, arid place. It was not a place that people wanted to spend time in. Because it was dry, it was rocky, it was desolate, it was depressing. But you know what? They had to stop here in this valley on the way to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast. And it was kind of, kind of, kind of depressing. But you know what? The motivation to get to Jerusalem, the motivation to get to the temple and to worship God, to get to God, you know what? It made the pilgrims who were making this trek, it made the valley of Baca like a spring. It made it like an oasis. Because they had to get to the house of God. They were full of anticipation and motivation to get there. And what is a deeper point for us? It is this, that God refreshes 
us in our journey. When we get dry, when we get tired, when it's a dry place, when it's a weary place, you know what? God refreshes us. And sometimes our tears will make pools of refreshing and rain to our weary souls. That's what God does. And you know what? We go. We go from strength to strength. Look at verse 7. From strength to strength. What does that mean? It means that as we go through the trials, as we go through the dry times, as we go through the challenges in our faith and our walk with Christ, it gets us, it makes us stronger. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Sometimes you've been just laid out, haven't you, in your faith? And you felt like, Lord, I can't go another step. God, I'm so tired. And what happens? God refreshes you. And the Holy Spirit encourages you. And you get stronger. And you pick yourself back up, or rather God picks you up, and you take some more steps. And what do you find? You get stronger, and then you come to another time, another dry place. And yet you get stronger every time you go from strength to strength. That's what the Bible here is talking about. We get stronger in our faith as we go through the dry times. Amen. And we are refreshed by the Holy Spirit. And you know what we learn? We learn it's not about us. We learn it's not in our strength. We learn that the only hope that we have is in the strength of Almighty God. Right, brothers and sisters? Amen. The only hope we have is in His strength. That's what we learn. And that motivates us. It motivates us and encourages us. And it makes the dry times like an oasis. Because we know our God is faithful and our God's going to do it. They grow stronger and stronger and stronger. They go from strength to strength. And then we have this to look forward to. Look what Jesus said in Matthew 25, 21. Do you want to hear these words? You will hear these words. Trust in these words. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. If that doesn't motivate you, I don't know what will. If that doesn't motivate me, I don't know what will. To hear and anticipate these words by our Lord Jesus Christ. Well done, good and faithful servant. You know what? You've been faithful in a few things. Not all things. Maybe not even some things. But a few things you've been faithful. Jesus said, I'll make you ruler over how many things? Many. Isn't that what he said? Look at your outline. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Why would Jesus say that? Listen to me. Because Jesus is faithful in all things. Amen. We're faithful in a few things. He's going to make us ruler over many things because He's faithful in all things. That's the truth of our God. Does that motivate you? Amen. It should motivate all of us to continue on the journey. You may be in a very dry time in your spiritual life, in your walk with Christ. Maybe nobody knows it but you. Maybe your spouse, your son or daughter, mother or father, maybe nobody knows it but you. You may be in a very dry time. But you know what? Be motivated that your Lord and your God is faithful. And He's going to see you through you know what? Focus on the third point. Fill this in. The inspiration to trust in God. That's what we need above all things. The inspiration to trust in God. Yes, anticipation is good. We should anticipate being in the house of God. We should anticipate being in a temple made without hands. Yes, motivation is good to get to God. But we need above all the inspiration to trust in God. The inspiration to trust in God. Because this is the truth about our God. Look at verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord God is. He is a living God. He is present tense. He is a sun and shield. He is the sun to drive away the darkness in your life. He is the sun to warm you on those cold days. The Lord our God is a sun. He is a sun. And He's also a shield. A shield of protection to defend you. That's who He is. The Lord our God, He is a sun and a shield. And the Lord will give grace and He'll give glory. Did you know that? He'll give you grace. You know what grace is, right? It's amazing, is it not? We sang about it this morning. Grace is undeserved favor. God will give you favor when you don't deserve it. 
Can we all get an amen to that? Amen. How many times has God given us favor when we know we don't deserve it? All, all the time. We evaluate our lives, and what else can we say when we look at our works, and when we look at our thought life, and when we look at our... We can always say to God, you know what? I'm pretty despicable. And my efforts, my efforts are pretty lame, to say the least. But it's God's grace. He still gives us His favor. The Lord will give grace and what? Glory. Glory. No good thing will He withhold from those who walk up. Do you believe that, church? God will not withhold any good thing from any person that walks up right when He walks into you. You believe God's holding something good from you? If you believe that, you're deceived. God will not hold any good thing from those who walk upright. And if God is withholding something from you, it's not good. Think about that. If God is withholding something from you, it's not as good as what you think it may be. Because He will not withhold any good thing from those who walk upright. That's, that's, that inspires me. Does it inspire you? It inspires me that the Lord my God is my Son and is my shield. He is the sun and the shield of my life. Amen. He won't withhold any good, any good thing from me. And He will give grace and glory. And blessed is the man, verse 12, blessed is the man who trusts in Him. Blessed is the man who trusts in Him. Where do you want to be, church family? Where do you want to be? Today, right now. Here? Where do you want to be? Whenever God calls you home, you want to be with Him. Amen. You know what? He is always with us. Think about this. You know, I, I look, look at this in some point. See, the Lord our God is always with us, and we can get to His throne of grace at any time. I know the anticipation to be with God. You know what? God is always with us. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have anticipation to come into His house and anticipation to drop this flesh and to drop this broken world and be with Him? Yes, but He is always with us. What did Jesus say? I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. The Lord's always with us. And you know what motivation we get to God? We can come to God anytime. Because what does the Bible say in Hebrews? We can boldly approach the throne of grace. Anytime. Because we're under the new covenant. We can come to Jesus Christ anytime. What does it say? The Bible says boldly, confidently approach the throne of grace to obtain help in our time of need. We can come to God. We have that motivation. We can come to God anytime, 24-7. And He's always with us. And this inspires us. The inspiration that only comes from trusting in God. Blessed is the man or the woman who trusts in Him. Where do you want to be? You want to be in heaven? So uh, you want to be with the Lord? So do I. You don't want to be in this world anymore? Neither do I. But know this. God's going to get you there. Amen. God's going to get you there. We're not going to get there by our works, are we? We're not going to get there by our faithfulness, are we? Who's going to get us there? Our God is going to get us there. I hope all of you are inspired by that. Because as we were talking in Sunday school this morning, you know what? God's love is consistent. It doesn't fluctuate. And so many times we as human beings, we think, oh, well, I've read my Bible more this week than I have in years. God must love me more. Right? No, God's love is consistent. When we sometimes we fail, we say, oh, I haven't done this, and I failed to do that, and I've just been a wreck this week. God must not love me as much as He did last week. That's not true. God's love is what? It's consistent. It doesn't change. It doesn't change. How are you going to get to heaven? By the grace of God. What do you need to do? Believe it. We are saved by grace through what? Through faith. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. We're saved by grace through faith. God's going to get us. God's going to get us. That inspires me. Boy, if I had to trust in West Belfast, you'd give me heaven. <laughs> Wouldn't we all be around? God's not against 
where do you want to be? Oh, Father, thank you, Lord, that in our hearts and even in our flesh, we cry out to the living God. When we're truly worshiping you, Lord, in spirit and truth, we know, we know you are everything good. You are everything true. You are everything holy. You are all light and love. And we long to be with you. We long to be with you. And Lord, we should anticipate being with you and in your house. And Lord, maybe you've corrected some of your people. Maybe you've, Lord, disciplined some of your people, Lord. We should be more motivated to come to church. We should be more motivated to be with you. We should be more motivated, Lord, to approach your throne of grace in our daily times of private study and devotion. Because you are always there. But Lord, we are inspired by your grace. We are inspired by your faithfulness this morning. We are inspired, Lord, by your goodness and your mercy that endures forever. And we are inspired especially by the love that you have shown us through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are inspired by his atoning sacrifice upon the cross. We are inspired that greater love Greater love could no man have than to lay down his life for his friends. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for demonstrating us the love that inspires, the love that is true, the love that is real, that you have for us that never changes. And Lord, as we have a time of just silent devotion and prayer this morning, I pray that you would please help your people to understand your love and your grace and your faithfulness. Lord, maybe they haven't been inspired by anything for a long time. Well, look to the cross and be inspired. Look to the love of God and be inspired. Trust in Him. Trust in Him. Be thankful.